architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. This is Vikram Prakash and you are yet once again listening to Architecture Talk. Currently we are going through a mini-series, Architecture in the Time of Coronavirus, where we are trying to advance the frontier of architectural thinking in a way that is concerned directly and indirectly with the fantastic and, and, and deleterious uh, constraints on social and daily life that has been put on us by the coronavirus situation. Uh, we will continue to have these recordings for the next few weeks. Uh, and today I'm excited to note that with this episode, we are also going to begin to publish a series of new uh, visual graphics, uh, cartoons, if you like, uh, that uh, somehow are responsive to our conversation being done by Tori Haynes, who designed the uh, logo of Architecture Talk as well. Uh, look out for these on our website, uh, architecturedoc.org, and if you have any thoughts and con comments, please do let us know. Uh, today I'm talking to Mitchell, Joaquim, and Nick uh, of Terraform, who have this fantastic experimental practice uh, that is very interested in uh, thinking about another kind of architecture, a future architecture which is bio-friendly, which works with uh, biology in a manner that we are not used to. A very German discussion in the current context. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Uh, Nick and Mitch, uh, welcome to Architecture Talk. Thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with me. We're super glad to uh, be here with you. I've been uh, looking at your website, uh, Terraform, and it's a fascinating website. It appears and presents itself as a kind of, as, as a radical alternative practice. And I'm very excited to talk to you because the kinds of contentions that you are putting forth in your practice seem to be uh, particularly germane to these very strange and interesting times that we find ourselves in with the with the coronavirus, uh, not so much in terms of the isolation that we have uh, we, are, we are finding ourselves in, but in terms of what it means in one sense to live with a, a pandemic, to how to live with a germ, how to live with a, another kind of living matter in a way that you know in this case governs our life form. So. In your in, in the introduction to your book, uh, Design with Life, uh, actually, you know, I think, Mitch, this is uh, your book. You talk about the importance uh, at, at Terraform of the regenerative use of natural materials and the emergent field of socio-ecological design. You say your, your approach to design uses actual living matter. Actual living matter. Yeah. Uh, not abstracted imitations of nature to create new functional elements and spaces. And, and I've seen, you know, some of your projects online and, and a short te TED Talk uh, that's online. And, and very much so, it's about, uh, you talk about growing materials and uh, as living systems, as living entities, uh, using... Uh, uh, anal sphincters as windows provocatively, and so on and so forth. Talk to us about why is it that you are so focused on actual living matter as the, as the, as the fabric of, of, of contemporary or future-oriented architectural thinking versus, let's say, things that are more imitative or, or performative? Yeah, I like, I love that introduction. And the fact that you somehow were able to weave in anal sphincter into the conversation early on, <laughs> you just got that out of the way. <laughs> that, that's good. That's good. We've, we've, uh, we've reached that point. We can, um, we can handle it from here. You know, for a very long time, there has been 
these ideas about environment and architecture, and it's uh, it's becoming something of a bromide. I think that uh, almost every firm needs to incorporate ideas about sustainability, ideas about green, certainly concepts that work within the Earth's metabolism. That's that's something that uh, many firms have been doing, especially post postmodernism. Uh, that that has been mm-hmm. uh, a, a, just a, a polemic that's nonstop. We have branched off probably two more levels into this idea of, of green. And maybe it started with notions of organic architecture, which if we go to Frank Lloyd Wright, have a very different meaning than I would say perhaps Calatrava, et cetera, and, and some of the biomimicrists. And now there is, uh, you know, others like uh, uh, John Todd and I guess uh, Rachel Armstrong and, and Jenny Sabin, like our David Benjamin, people that really are working directly with living organisms, not mimicking right. organisms or decorative elements. Right. I, I just published a podcast interview with Rachel Armstrong, by the way, but go on. There you go. Uh, she is absolutely brilliant. And, you know, we love her work. And she's been a close colleague also for some time. So her and Mark Jarzenbach are some really good people to keep company with. But the idea that you mimic nature is not new. Uh, Mimesis has been around since Aristotle, certainly ancient China. This is not, this is a global kind of uh, uh, concept. Where else did early humankind look to find ideas but in the natural world? So that, mm-hmm. that's not really special, certainly not to architects, but Frank Lloyd Wright liked to use the term organic. And right, he, did. he did. And he meant that in a number of ways. There's some arguments about programmatic inside and outside, uh, ideas about decoration and material, but it was still very much concrete, mm-hmm. glass and steel in a context that is wilderness or wildness. Right. We've decided that we've got to go one notch further and actually have things that are alive and are actual uh, organisms in a kind of an epigenetic context. So it's not only the or- why why is that the critical distinction here? Yeah. Yeah. So we 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 have in every project have have sort of involved in some level or another uh, working with said organisms, whether it's E. coli for a mapping project is an analog form of computation. That's our bio city map project, or it's mycelium, which is a root base of uh, mushrooms. In this case, reishi that help us make materials that are grown in a lab and turn into something like triply curved surfaces, or even something as, as uh, prosaic as a chair to working with, um, butterflies that are on the edge of extinction and designing facade systems to keep them alive and a whole range of other creatures that we have been working with. And that means that it's not just architects involved. It's uh, we've got entomologists, we've got people who do molecular cell biology. At, at Terraform One, we have been engaged in our new overriding predicate, which is design against extinction. So that's our new mission. What was previously a kind of a, uh, you know, a new order or a series of revelations about organic architecture have now translated, or I should say transitioned into something that is much more urgent uh, to recognize that the crises we are still in, uh, including this virus, which is this idea of biodiversity and its loss and our own biology confronting things in nature that are not only killing us off because of our own industries that work on the planet, and extract resources, but also exposure to new viruses is another kind of more recent realization. So this this uh, this idea that um, we have to design ourselves out of extinction is is uh, more prevalent than ever. I think that uh, what we're seeing now is we are facing extinction, and it's due to the fact that um, that we're one biology. It doesn't matter what your ethnic background is, your 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 income, your religion. Uh, what language you speak, we all are being uh, affected by the same virus and can all be affected by the same kind of medical condition that uh, is very real. Talk to me, Mitch, about this sort of uh, ethical location 
of this position? You know, where does this come from in terms of contemporary thinking to talk about all of us as one biology, not only humans, but as all species as one biology? And you have already indicated the idea of uh, staving off extinction as a kind of a goal or direction. So what is the ethical position that you are taking in focusing on this? It's not an anthropocentrism. Is it a kind of a species being positioned? How do you articulate that? Uh, well, it's, it's very much uh, in the vein of, of deep ecology, where you recognize yep. uh, an identification for all living systems, or inorganic and organic. Yep. So the geological has a kind of an identification. Rocks have a kind of an understanding of a placement in the order of things. Uh, the smallest, most minuscule fungi has meaning and identification. All organisms, insects, etc., uh, birds, corals, they, all of them have a kind of relationship. And it is a relationship without hierarchy. I think that's really important. So Arne Ness. Why, why without hierarchy? It seems like the ecologies have all kinds of hierarchy. Yeah, because uh, hierarchy assumes that there is an alpha predator or uh, a, a kind of a steward, which is often assigned uh -huh. uh, to man as being the leaders or the ones that are responsible for how the web of life is treated. But in reality, if you knock out one major component of this web of life, everything else starts to collapse. Uh, and and that, is, that is the reality. So the idea that there is a pyramidal structure where humans are at the top or dolphins, depending on your perspective, and everything sort of trickles down is absurd. It is, it is a feedback loop. It's a series of lattices uh, that Mm -hmm. connect different systems together in a community-based organization. And I think that's a, that is, that's new ecology and that's real ecology. It's either systems thinking or community thinking or both. And it is that, but it's not hierarchical in any sense. We humans are no better than some fungi. Right. But you sort of privilege what you call pioneering acts of design as a kind of a critical practice over here to combat, as you say, the extinction of all planetary species. So what do you mean by design from this very specific? What is the act of design in this kind of a uh, integrated, let's say, uh, deep ecological perspective? Design in our um, kind of meaning of the term, we like to specify it as something that's known as socio-ecological design. And, yeah. and so we're pioneering design in a new form, one that recognizes that there is a science and an engineering side that produces very specified solutions in very discrete right. moments in, in fields that have ways of quantifying and understanding issues. Uh, and then there is the social side, which is the capricious public, the leadership class, decisions made from outside the normal realm of, of science and architecture and urbanism. And, and that these just, these things need to uh, work in tandem. That they they both affect one another. And just because science tells us to do it does not mean people go ahead and make those decisions. So we design in that that stream, and it's very similar to painting a watercolor in a stream, which is a, a thing I kind of a, a, an analogy I often use, which is that you you kind of come up with the with these decisions. But then as you're painting them or putting them down, something else influences them and redistributes the flow. So design needs to be facile. It needs to, to uh, be constantly reconfigurable. And at some moment, it's frozen. Right. We get that. But, but uh, right. in this web of life where we're trying to pioneer or change or innovate, we accept invention as a constant. And, and part of this, you also talk about the necessity of being actively, whatever you want to call it, transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary or undisciplined, yeah. if you like. Yeah. Are we simply collaborating with ecologists and uh, organicists and uh, uh, nanotechnologists and so on? Or is this require a new kind of uh, knowledge engagement across disciplines? What is your sense of that? Yeah, we uh, we think that the the kind of the orthodox understanding of architecture and arth architecture pedagogy, uh, as always, every generation says it's in some kind of crises, and we need to 
help uh, jumpstart a new system. So we, we think of it as actually a heterodox. It's a, a mixture of all disciplines without boundaries or filters, and that it's okay uh, for an architect to change his or her hat and be a car designer, and a car designer to actually think about designing landscapes, and a landscape uh, ecologist designs cars, and that all of these things kind of capture or, or sort of merge into one another and you rethink the system in its entirety. So the, the heterodoxic or the heterodoxical approach uh, has been something we've adopted. And I think that's just because it, we really don't want to steal from robotics or borrow from philosophy like we did in the 90s and, 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 and stick an architecture label on it. I think we really need a truly remixed uh, primordial soup of different engagements from all professions. Unfortunately, architects are the one ones doing most of this work. It, you'd be hard pressed to find someone in cancer research uh, starting to think about architecture. But there may be a day when they can do it. There might come a day when they can do it. I mean, in your practice, it seems you are experimentally doing uh, molecular biology or at least some kind of biological work. Yeah, yeah. Early, early on, we were making a decision. Uh, the co-founder, Maria Elova and myself, we uh, teamed up with my roommate from, from school. He was uh, at the Harvard Medical School and he was doing research on aging and molecular cell biology. And for seven years, we had been sort of dreaming of a combined studio slash laboratory. And the only way to get deep into a kind of a remixed design agenda is to actually have a physical working space that combines both disciplines, if not more. So instead of buying a fancy 3D printer, uh, Terraform One invested in uh, a, a fully functional wet cell laboratory with uh, Oliver <laughs> Medvedic as our, our molecular cell biologist, who was part of our team for years and still is. He now runs the Ken Barr Center for Bioengineering at Cooper Union. But he, he, uh, we all together built a lab from scratch. And what would normally cost a few million dollars, we actually put together by using different platforms, Facebook and Craigslist and eBay. We made some of our own equipment. We did our, designed our own, we did a DIY PCR machine. We created our own laminar flow hoods. We, we got incubators from some folks in North Carolina where we rented a pickup truck and bought them for next to nothing, uh, centrifuges, et cetera. We put together a lab and then decided on what projects would architects and biologists do design side by side. And that was, uh, that became super interesting because now we are, we were beginning this path of truly thinking about an organic architecture, one that uses living matter directly here at the cellular scale. It's good to bootstrap this sort of operation. And we, we, in India, we call it Jugaad sort of thinking. Uh -huh. uh, but if one is to integrate this into an actual, uh, you know, I don't know, research and teaching academy, uh, what is your sense of how this would function as a school of... Uh, uh, do you want to call it a school of architecture or do you want to call it a school of what? Yeah. And how might how, how do you think this kind of a thinking translates into a formalized research and teaching institution? Yeah, well, that's a great question because there this would be a heterodoxic pedagogy, which would upset many of those in administration. <laughs> Hope, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. If they're paying attention. We would do away with the atelier. I mean, we've had this since the Beaux-Arts. We've had the studio model for two centuries plus, depending on how you want to count it. And studio is phenomenal. But I think that there's been some very recent movement into this kind of idea of tinkering and DIY and maker spaces. And you'll find a lot of studio desks where they look more like the desk of an inventor uh, or some mad biologist or what mad scientist than they do a uh, typical architect with some kind of mechanical drawing system or you know a laptop running CAD. So the, the, the physical space of the studio itself in a, in a teaching environment needs to change. It's sort of like taking the shop with the wood shop, which is always separate than the studio itself and putting a little bit of 
that on everyone's desk. But it's not just a workshop. But can we can we go more radical than that? And can we imagine a full university, which is just uh, nucleated around a series of maker spaces, in which there are all kinds of making going on with with you know molecular biologists, nanotechnologists, architects, yeah. and uh, poetry majors working together in a single space at one maker lab and different configurations in others. Is that the kind of uh, university you would imagine? Yes, um, and you said it, and I, I think there's precedent for it. The early models of the Media Lab, you know, the Architecture Machine Group mm-hmm. was just like that uh, under Nicholas Necroponte mm-hmm. and eventually Bill Mitchell and others. Uh, the Electronic Studio is imagined to be that. That was also William J. Mitchell. And uh, the new lab space that we're in now. So not only can you do this on a pedagogical level as a newfangled university, where all of these things are mixed together, similar to the media lab, but that uh, uh, that interdisciplinary mindset could exist on a commercial level, which is what we've done at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, producing the new lab. We have 120 different companies that work in waste, food, water, energy, mobility, all different kinds of sectors, and they're on top of one another. And it's in it's this open platform where we share manufacturing spaces and prototyping spaces and build out zones and conference rooms but that uh, we're learning from one another side by side. And it's very different than a school model. A school model, if you don't succeed, you get a bad grade. And a commercial model, if you don't succeed, you lose everything. All your money's gone and you're out the door. So it's a a, stakes are much, much higher, but it's the system. And the, the, the kind of the fertile environment that you create is exciting. It's just electric with energy as people are trying every day, vying for new kinds of concepts and technologies and to learn from one another to pull ahead. And it's, it's, it's super successful. And it's not driven by capitalism. It's driven by curiosity, a much better C word to use. And I think that that's, that's, that's that's the type of environment that thrives both in academia and in the kind of commercial world. And I think that's an important point about access to platforms. And that's exactly what we experienced at, at New Lab, where when you remove the science lab from the science building, and now it just becomes more of a place to experiment, then you get that organic, mm-hmm. informal overlaps between people of different backgrounds. And that allows them uh, this sort of collection point of ideas, where then you understand the intelligence of the community. So I think what we're all getting at here is that there's there seems to be these... Um, like trappings of knowledge where things don't spread between fields. And when you start to open up some of these spaces, then you allow those ideas to trickle out and be infused into one another. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's great. So, so Nick, I mean, let me uh, shift uh, a little bit uh, gears over here and, and say that uh, so far and the way you represent yourself, uh, a lot of your work seems to be very, well, and I don't mean this glibly at all, but I mean this seriously, as you have described it, very technology driven. It's like developing techniques and uh, ways of working. And yet I would argue if one looks at your work, it, it also has a very distinctive uh, aesthetic, if you like, right? I mean, you have already spoken about the uh, uh, archigram, but there's also sort of the metabolist kind of uh, references. How, where do you locate the aesthetics uh, of your work? What is their pedigree? Well, maybe maybe I can answer this, Nick. I, I think when it comes to aesthetics, if it isn't directly derived from functionality, which is a huge part of it, and pragmatism, believe it or not, uh, which is a, 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 a big part of it, it's driven by desire. We actually want to build into the object or the artifact something that just is exciting, that gets people engaged, and that it, that kind of produces produces a sense of it's fabulous. And I think that's that's the kind of the cultural side of it. That's, that's what, though it separates architecture from engineering. At some point, we are just going to do something because it's aesthetically, it's um, not pleasing. That's not our goal, but evocative. And I think that's, that is uh, always the kind of base premise when we uh, kind of take on another project. Describe to me your most evocative, exciting, desirous uh, recent work. W- which one really got your blood pumping? Right. Uh, besides my girlfriend, I guess, uh, I, which is <laughs> an ongoing project. 
the, I would say, uh, well, we, our cricket shelter is a great example. Here we're doing a very practical right. farming system to eat bugs, to replace uh, different types of protein. And I can get more on that later. But at, at some point we were dealing with the natural ventilation of the system and we were hearing the chirping of the crickets come through these, these wind cowls, these vents. And we thought this was an amazing opportunity not to just get the ventilation system working, but to accentuate that sound as an instrument and produce what we called cricket horns so that the, the sound gets magnified of these crickets chirping, which is actually straddle, straddleization. It means that the males are essentially horny because they're past survival, they're well-fed and they're looking to procreate. So we wanted to, we wanted to celebrate all of our, I guess there would be clients in this case, doing really well in our farm colony and turn those, those very subtle sounds into a kind of um, a, a cricket opera. So we produce these uh -huh. really extended <laughs> instruments that move through the wind system and, and, have, and have the cricket chirping magnified. And that's, that's where we go to something that is much, that, that drives into provocation and aesthetics and curiosity and is not just done to solve a functional condition. Fantastic. I love the cricket opera concept. Yeah. <laughs> but let's use that as the opportunity to, to, to displace the conversation in a little bit and say, are you working on a coronavirus shelter? Can we imagine a coronavirus opera? What, how do you think we should design with life? How, do, how does one design with life with respect to the uh, virus, if that's a good term yeah, for it. Right. Yeah, we were just speaking about this earlier today. And yeah, we think that it's it's a super architectural moment to rethink how we enter and how we inhabit buildings. And the phenomena that goes on in New York City every winter is that all these bars and restaurants build these little vestibules outside so that when they open their entrance doors, they're not directly into the element. So they're into this sort of um, right. space, entry space before you get into the main space. And we we're just thinking about, well, are there ways to apply this sort of same logic to the virus and sterilization? And you can almost imagine walking through um, a portal that has UV lights to kill the germs on your body, or there's some uh, type of station inside the, the bar that then once you pass through, then now you can uh, get food or get a drink. And thinking at the same way that ADA had to uh, deal with the retrofit, right? We had to reimagine uh, stairwells and handrails and access with our existing template and streetscapes in the same way that with the virus we have, um, we can't just reimagine a new city with where we can factor in these social distancing parameters. We have to deal with are often uh, very close encounters. Right. Let me push a little bit on that. Uh, I mean, you are in my, you're sort of producing like a, a modification to our, our urban environment. And I know you all are very interested in uh, its cities and, and, and urban transformations as well. Let me fasten in on your use of the word germ and ask, you know, how does the idea of germ or, you know, if you want hostile organisms integrate into an architectural philosophy that is about, as you said, a new kind of an organic architecture. Do we pick and select the organics we work with, some we work with, some we defend against, or are, or are we to somehow work with all kinds of organisms? Yeah, I mean... Um... That's a great question. In, in general, we have been working with ideas of modular biodiversity. So we've been creating these uh, mosaic biotope wall systems that are kind of a plug and play uh, facade element that is at a known scale and size and basically creates a double skin on the outside of your building. And inside it is a terrarium with all different types of flora and fauna that are teeming and engaged and very much alive. And the thought is, is that it would, it would help some kind of uh, creature that doesn't necessarily have a voice uh, survive and make it off a red list or, or get out of the endangered species list. 
uh, and, and be integrated fully into your building. And this would help incredibly increase biodiversity inside cities because you'd be able to use... And that would include germs as well, yes? It would include a whole host of germs. And many of them uh, you know, yeah. are, are, are good for us, uh, certainly yeah, exposure sure. to them. Uh, so when you're, when you're talking about something that's dangerous, well, one of the things that a wall system like this does or other variants is really look at air quality conditions and airflow conditions. And this, is, this becomes a great moderator or filter between us and uh, some kind of outside germ condition or the interior sort of exhausting into a, a condition that filters it before it goes to the final layer, the outside air. So it's these, these, these kind of buffer zones that use just the right mix of biodiverse elements that sort of moderate the inside and the outside, moving in both directions. And this is nothing new. Anna Dyson uh, did this with Case at Rensselaer, and now she's at Yale. But they were looking at mm -hmm. applying plant filters instead of HEPA filters, but live plant species in hospitals as a way of getting rid of germs and potential airborne diseases that exist, uh, that are rampant in hospital environments. Because we're very good at hermetically sealing buildings uh, and then sort of punching a hole in it after we've sealed it completely. Mm -hmm. So here, these are ways of, of, of adding in flow and using uh, you know, the stuff of life, various bits of, of nature uh, to kind of clean or cleanse it or have it pass through these filters. That doesn't mean that if we have a particular virus that has a penchant for the kind of plants we're using and it ends up thriving in there and, and affecting all the humans in a, in a detrimental way, that, that could possibly happen. But the likelihood of that is, is I think, um, less so. It's m more likely to be a positive filter for everyone because we're including thousands of species. Uh, yeah, I guess I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that as we, as, as we you know, submit to or surrender to or integrate with or work with these sort of broader ecological processes which, in which we are not you know, the controlling overlords, then we are definitely uh, likely to be more susceptible to the instabilities and unexpected, uh, you know, negative effects of these systems on us too, right? And we are learning that that's completely true by this pandemic that's mm -hmm. uh, that's around now and probably is going to show up every, I don't know, a minimum 100 years, possibly more. So, uh, and is that acceptable? Yeah. Is that acceptable risk? Well, you know, I think from a philosophical standpoint, man, especially modern man, is suffering from this hubris that thinks that we can control nature and that we are in some kind of level of authority or stewardship or in charge of this system. We are not. We are not at all. Right. And this is one of the most humbling moments in modern times is the COVID-19 virus where we realize how fragile we are, how easily our system can break down, both biological and economic based. And that uh, this does get us a kind of um, a sense of togetherness and realize that nature is still quite the most dominant force here. And that the, the mm -hmm. best hope we have to working and fighting these kinds of things is to spend much more time understanding nature and working with nature and to defining exactly what we mean by nature is that that in and of itself is an open term. So this is more of the, the dark ecologist perspective, you know, Tim Morton and others huh. where, you know, this is, right. this is don't, don't use the term nature. We should use the term ecology and, and, and that uh, at any moment the earth just needs to shrug and we all disappear. Like we, we are, we right. are, we are just, we are, a momentary blessing on this planet historically. So, so talk to me a little bit more about this dark ecologist ecologist perspective. Would you identify your work? If dark ecology is about accepting both the positive symbiotic relations, but also simultaneously recognizing that eco the ecology is a, also a battlefield with with the with the kind of uh, defenses and uh, and uh, that we'll have to put up and fight against certain things. If that is what dark ecology is, do you think your work is participant in that kind of a worldview? Um, I, I mean, it, it is. It, our work isn't centered around dark ecology, and others like Kings North 
not just, uh, and the, I think they're called the Black Mountaineers or the, the Black Mountain Group. Like these are, these are individuals that essentially define dark ecology as the science has been out there for some time. The platform about climate change has been out there for some time. Carbon loading in the atmosphere is, is constantly accelerating. The, the human race isn't getting it. And no matter what we say or do, from any perspective, humanities or science, we are spiraling into this kind of collision where the environment is going to take us out in one way or the other. So the, the dark ecologist viewpoint is essentially run and hide, wait for the crises, which is the big premise in dark ecology, which we're in now. COVID-19 is that global. Here we are. Here, Here we, we are. are. Yeah. And then after this crisis, we've got, we've got one chance to get it right, to create civilization 2.0 that finds a relationship, a symbiotic one with the Earth's metabolism or what have you, but really pays attention to ideas about renewables and how we're poisoning the atmosphere and different types of energy, or we don't get it. And we we become susceptible to the next crises, which would uh, wipe us out completely. So this is our big warning. This is the, the, the largest possible uh, you know, warning shot across the bow, so to speak, because things like Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, the Valdez spill, the Gulf spill, Fukushima, on and on and on. Apparently, they weren't big enough and loud enough. Uh, Chernobyl, mm -hmm. I guess. Like these were all major crisis-driven events that gave us an understanding of how the environment can be affected and how it ignores geopolitical boundaries and affects all children and all families. So here we are confronting probably the largest one in modern times. And if we don't get it right, shame on us. So this is our kind of clarion call. And a dark ecologist would definitely point to that moment. Uh, and so now, now it's time to rise to the occasion. And it should be easier to explain to the political class and the public at large what kind of problems we're facing when it comes to the environment. And here are some really rational solutions. But to return to your work, I mean, yeah. so uh, what do you think is the, uh, uh, what would you pick out as some, uh, as key trajectories found in your work that could be, that you would foreground as we start to think about architecture, rethink architecture uh, in, in a post-COVID world? What, what are the things you would highlight from your practice as key uh, uh, DNA to, to project? Hmm. Um, well, uh, I, think, I think our practice had been doing it for the last 14 years. So we, we were working with live organisms and now it's, it's becoming uh, almost a must. I think that having the architecture mindset uh, involved in, in sort of wellness and understanding environment from the perspective of humans, uh, as opposed from the perspective of birds and woods. Uh, I think that's another kind of factor that would be uh, a, a kind of a change for us. Because um, we were always making the argument that it's it's about the kind of the context, not necessarily us. But the, the well certification people and others, which we paid attention to, I think now are there their sort of voice is gonna get a lot louder because people are going to realize we're fragile and let's design for an environment that protects us. And, and in so doing, we are protecting nature around us. So, so, so that for, for our practice, that means absolutely being almost, uh, having zero tolerance for the terrible uses of concrete uh, for, steel that's applied in a way that is uh, just just superfluous for materials in general that are high embodied energy and and don't really support the earth's metabolism and for building topologies that um, seemingly don't make sense are only done because they're driven by economics uh, you know the uh, what's her Carol Willis's book form follows finance will point out to skyscrapers don't make sense financially after 50 something stories so the idea that we would support, or we, I mean, we would do opposite of supporting. We would criticize, you know, towers that are, you know, have 120 floors because of some kind of ego-driven uh, development. 
uh, or, or a lot of these ones we're seeing in Central Park, these super tall, slender buildings that are just there for the global elite to occupy real estate. Uh, right, right. So, so I think we're there, there's been many who have been sort of making these arguments. We're going to join them, and I think uh, they will be the kind of the, the dominant point of discussion these days, and, and not because it's a self righteous righteous perspective. But because we can't afford to to go back to some of the old habits, this should not be uh, you know driven by clients and their their bottom line. Okay, so at, yeah, sorry. Uh, as we move towards the end over here, uh, a couple of sort of uh, uh, left field kind of questions. Mm-hmm. First, well, since you have brought up the question of capitalism driven uh, uh, architectural work. Uh, let me first ask quickly. So, how, how how is your practice funded? You are a large group. Yeah, how do you do that? So we we uh, we're funded uh, in a number of formats. So one, we have grants uh, that we get from different foundations. Uh, that's uh, or or grant uh, grants from corporations. So it's either Ovarup, uh, the engineering group, BASF. Uh, the R and R Foundation. So these are these are things that help fund and pay for our our staff and employees. So we have a fellowship program that drives that. Then we second way we we have an income is through commissions in in major museums and galleries. So we will we will get funding to do projects uh, and projects of our own choosing from these kinds of commissions. And then the third way, which is a lot smaller, is from private donations or patrons that uh, work as clients with us, that are enlightened clients that uh, help drive a project or, or team with us to develop something in tandem. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, I, I was very excited to see that you had such a strong and vital practice using using this model uh, and with so many people, generally, you know, more conceptual practices tend to be uh, more m- smaller. Uh, so I think that's that's a great role model for other practices. If, to, to if, I, if I can interrupt you, I'll add one last thing. Our, our secret sauce is uh, Vivian Kwan. She is our executive uh-huh. director and she has an undergraduate degree from Cornell in architecture, but she has an MBA from the Wharton Business School. And Bringing an MBA on the team, I talk about heterodox or interdisc practices, you, it is vital that architects at the highest possible level, if not at all levels, incorporate folks who understand business development, who understand contracts, who understand macroeconomics. Like these are things that I had four, no, 13 years of full-time uh, education in architecture school between the doctorates and two master degrees. I had a one semester of professional practice. My entire life has been professional practice after I graduated. So it's I, we just need more business and understanding business uh, in architecture period. Bjarke Ingels, his firm, I think something like 25% of the people in his office are MBAs. So there's a big advantage to getting into that language as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to take note. Yeah. Well, you know, actually right now it's seven o'clock in New York City. I don't know if you know about this, but the entire city, every borough is outside their windows and they're screaming right now. So this has been going on for the last 40 days. So the, the sound is quite loud where I am in Harlem. I don't know how it is by you, Nick, but it's uh, it's just the New York Times did an amazing piece on just how many people are out there screaming. And usually it's celebrating the emergency workers saying thank you and and sending you know love beams to these people that are working every day to keep us alive uh nick and mitch thank you for taking the time thank you for all your work uh and i look forward to another conversation on architecture talk so thank you for having us we're really uh, uh we're super glad to be here and having this conversation and Honored to be a part of this ovoir of other amazing speakers and thinkers that uh, we can see with this podcast. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, 
please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thank you again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.